Jacob with Laban. Rachel's coming to the well at the moment when Jacob reached the territory belonging to Haran was an auspicious omen. To meet young maidens on first entering a city is a sure sign that fortune is favorable to one's undertakings. Experience proves this through Eliezer, Jacob, Moses, and Saul. They all encountered maidens when they approached a new place, and they all met with success. Jacob treated Rachel at once as a woman well known to him, which caused significant whispering among the bystanders. They looked down on Jacob for his demeanor towards her. Since God had sent the deluge on the world on account of the immoral life led by men, great chastity prevailed among the people of the East. The censure of the men reduced Jacob to tears. Scarcely had he kissed Rachel when he began to weep, for he repented of having done it. There was reason enough for tears. Jacob could not but remember sadly that Eliezer, his grandfather's slave, had brought ten camels laden with presents with him to Haran when he came to sue for a bride for Isaac, while he had not even a ring to give Rachel. Moreover, he foresaw that Rachel would be his favorite wife, but would not lie beside him in the grave. This, too, made him weep. As soon as Rachel heard that Jacob was her cousin, she ran home to tell her father about his coming. Her mother was no longer among the living, or else she would naturally have gone to her. In great haste, Laban ran to receive Jacob. He reflected, if Eliezer, the bondsman, had come with ten camels, what would the favorite son of the family bring with him? And when he saw that Jacob was unattended, he concluded that he carried great sums of money in his girdle and he threw his arms around his waist to find out whether his suspicion was true. Disappointed in this, he yet did not give up hope that his nephew Jacob was a man of substance. Perhaps he concealed precious stones in his mouth, and he kissed him in order to find out whether he had guessed right. But Jacob said to him, You think I have money. Sorry, you're mistaken. The only thing I have are my words. Then he went on to tell him how it came about that he stood before him empty-handed. He said that his father Isaac had sent him on his way provided with gold, silver, and money, but he had run into Eliphaz, who had threatened to slay him. To Eliphaz, Jacob had spoken thus, Remember, the descendants of Abraham have an obligation to meet. They will have to serve 400 years as slaves in a foreign land. If you kill me, then you and your descendants, the seed of Esau, will have to pay the debt. It would be better, therefore, to take all I have but spare my life, so that the debt owed may be paid by me and mine. Jacob continued speaking to Laban, I stand before you empty of all the treasures carried off by Eliphaz. This tale of his nephew's poverty filled Laban with dismay. What? he exclaimed. Shall I have to give food and drink for a month, or perhaps even a year, to this fellow who has come to me empty-handed? He went to his friends to ask them for counsel on the matter, and they admonished him, saying, Beware of sending him away from your house. His star and his consolation are so lucky that good fortune will attend all his undertakings, and for his sake the blessing of the Lord will rest on all you do, in your house and in your fields. Laban was satisfied with the advice, but he was embarrassed as to the way in which he should attach Jacob to his house. He did not want to offer employment, because Jacob's demands might be too high. Again he went to his counselors and asked them how to tempt his nephew to stay near him, and they replied, A wife is his wage. He will ask nothing else of you but a wife. It is his nature to be attracted by women, and whenever he threatens to leave you, just offer him another wife, and he will not depart. Laban went back to Jacob and said, Tell me, what do you want for wages? And he replied, Do you think I came here to make money? I came only to get a wife. For Jacob had no sooner beheld Rachel than he fell in love with her and made her a proposal of marriage. Rachel consented, but added the warning, my father is cunning, and you are not his match. Jacob, 
I am his equal in cunning. Rachel, but is deception becoming to the pious? Jacob, yes, when dealing with the righteous, righteousness is seemly, but with the deceiver, deception. Yet, continued Jacob, tell me how he may deal cunningly with me. Rachel, I have an older sister whom he desires to see married before me, and he will try to palm her off on you instead of me. To be prepared for Laban's trickery, Jacob and Rachel agreed on a sign by which he would recognize her in the nuptial night. Thus warned to be on his guard against Laban, Jacob worded his agreement with him regarding his marriage to Rachel with such precision that no room was left for distortion or guile. Jacob said, I know that you can be very tricky, therefore I want to put the matter very clearly. I will serve you seven years for Rachel, but not Leah, your daughter Rachel. Do not bring me some other woman named Rachel, and do not exchange the names of Rachel and Leah in the meantime. Nothing of this availed. Neither force nor gentle words can circumvent a rascal. Laban deceived not only Jacob, but also the guests he invited to the wedding. The Marriage of Jacob After Jacob had served Laban seven years, he said to him, The Lord destined me to be the father of twelve tribes. I am now eighty-four years old, and if I do not take thought of the matter now, when? Then Laban consented to let him have his daughter Rachel to wife. He was married forty-four years after his brother Esau. The Lord often defers the happiness of the pious, while he permits the wicked to enjoy the fulfillment of their desires soon. Esau, however, had purposely chosen his fortieth year for marriage. He had wanted to indicate that he was walking in the footsteps of his father Isaac, who had likewise married at forty years. Esau was like a swine that stretches out its feet when it lies down, to show it is cloven-footed like the clean animals though it is none the less one of the unclean animals. Until his fortieth year, Esau made a practice of violating the wives of other men, and then at his marriage he acted as if he were following the example of his pious father. Accordingly, the woman he married was one of his own kind, Judith, a daughter of Heth. For God said, This one who is destined to be burned by fire shall take to wife one of a people also destined for destruction. Esau and his wife were a good example of the saying, Not for nothing does the raven consort with the crow, for they are birds of a feather. Far differently it was with Jacob. He married two pious and lovely sisters, Leah and Rachel. For Leah, like her younger sister, was beautiful of countenance, form, and stature. She had but one defect. Her eyes were weak and this malady she had brought down on herself through her own action. Laban, who had two daughters, and Rebekah, his sister, who had two sons, had agreed by letter, while their children were still young, that the older son of the one was to marry the older daughter of the other, and the younger son the younger daughter. When Leah grew to maidenhood and inquired about her future husband Esau, all the news spoke of his villainous character and she wept over her fate until her eyelashes drooped from their lids. But Rachel grew more and more beautiful day by day, for all who spoke of Jacob praised and extolled him, and good tidings make the bones fat. In view of the agreement between Laban and Rebekah, Jacob refused to marry the older daughter Leah. As it was, Esau was his mortal enemy on account of what had happened regarding the birthright and the paternal blessing. If Jacob now married the maiden appointed to Esau, Esau would have even more excuse to never forgive him. Therefore, Jacob resolved to take Rachel, the younger daughter of his uncle. Laban was of another mind. He schemed to marry off his older daughter first, for he knew that Jacob would consent to serve him a second period of seven years for the love of Rachel. On the day of the wedding, he assembled the inhabitants of Haran and addressed them as follows. You know well that we used to suffer from lack of water, and as soon as this pious man Jacob came to live among us, we had water in abundance. So what have you in mind? 
they asked Laban. He replied, If you have nothing to say against it, I will deceive him and give him Leah to wife. He loves Rachel with a great love, and for her sake he will live with us another seven years, and we will continue to be blessed. Do as you please, his friend said. Well then, said Laban, let each one of you give me a money pledge that you will not betray my purpose. With the pledges they gave him, Laban bought wine, oil, and meat for the wedding feast. So he set a meal before them, which they themselves had paid for. Because he deceived his fellow citizens so, Laban is called Arami, the deceiver. They feasted all day long and late into the night, and when Jacob expressed his astonishment at the attention shown him, they said to him, Through your piety you did a great service of loving kindness to us. Our supply of water was increased in abundance, and we desire to show you our gratitude. Indeed, they did try to give him a hint of Laban's purpose. In the marriage ode which they sang, they used the refrain, Halia, in the hope that he would understand it as Ha, Leah, this is Leah. But Jacob was not suspicious and did not notice. When the bride was led into the nuptial chamber, the guest extinguished all the candles, much to Jacob's amazement, but their explanation satisfied him. Do you think we have as little sense of decency as your countrymen? Jacob, therefore, did not discover the deception until morning. During the night, Leah responded whenever he called Rachel, for which he reproached her bitterly when daylight came. You deceiver and daughter of a deceiver! Why did you answer me when I called Rachel's name? I am the student, and you are the teacher, said Leah. I but did as you did. When your father called you Esau, did you not say, Here I am? Jacob was then greatly enraged against Laban, and he said to him, Why did you deal treacherously with me? Take back your daughter and let me depart, seeing you acted wickedly toward me. Laban pacified him, however, saying, I don't know about where you come from, but around here we do not give the younger daughter before the older. And Jacob agreed to serve another seven years for Rachel, and after the seven days of the feast of Leah's wedding were fulfilled, he married Rachel. With Leah and Rachel, Jacob received the handmaids Zilpah and Bila, two other daughters of Laban, by his concubines. The Birth of Jacob's Children The ways of God are not like the ways of men. A man clings close to his friend when he has riches, and forsakes him when he falls into poverty. But when God sees a mortal unsteady and faltering, he reaches out a hand to him and raises him up. Thus it happened with Leah. She was hated by Jacob, and God visited her in mercy. Jacob's aversion to Leah began the very morning after the wedding, when his wife taunted him with not being wholly free from cunning and craft himself. Then God said, Help can come to Leah only if she gives birth to a child. Then the love of her husband will return to her. God remembered the tears she had shed when she prayed that her doom, chaining her to the evil Esau, be averted from her. And so wondrous are the uses of prayer that Leah, besides turning aside the impending disaster, was permitted to marry Jacob before her sister and be the first to bear him a child there was another reason why the Lord was compassionately inclined toward Leah. She had gotten herself talked about. The sailors on the sea, the travelers along the highway, the women at their looms, they all gossiped about Leah, saying, She is not within what she appears without. She appears to be pious, but if she were, she would not have deceived her sister. To put an end to all this tattle, God granted her the distinction of bearing a son at the end of seven months after her marriage. He was one of a pair of twins, the other child being a daughter. So it was with the eleven sons of Jacob. All of them, except Joseph, were born twins with a girl, and the twin sister and brother married later on. Altogether it was an extraordinary childbirth, for Leah was barren, not formed by nature to bear children. She called her firstborn son Reuben, 
which means see the normal man, for he was neither big nor little, neither dark nor fair, but exactly normal. In naming her oldest child Reuben, Leah indicated his future character. Behold the difference between my firstborn son and the firstborn son of my father-in-law. Esau sold his birthright to Jacob of his own free will, and yet he hated Jacob. As for my firstborn son, although his birthright was taken from him without his consent and given to Joseph, it was nevertheless he who rescued Joseph from the hands of his brothers. Leah called her second son Shimeon. Yonder is sin. For one of his descendants was that Zimri who was guilty of vile trespasses with the daughters of Moab. The name of her third son, Levi, was given to him by God himself, not his mother. The Lord summoned him through the angel Gabriel and bestowed the name on him as the one who is crowned with the twenty-four gifts that are the tribute due to the priests. At the birth of her fourth son, Leah returned thanks to God for a special favor. She knew that Jacob would beget twelve sons, and if they were distributed equally among his four wives, each would bear three. But now it appeared that she had one more than her due share, and she called him Judah, thanks to God. She was thus the first since the creation of the world to give thanks to God, and her example was followed by David and Daniel, the descendants of her son Judah. When Rachel saw that her sister had borne Jacob four sons, she envied Leah. Not that she begrudged her the good fortune she enjoyed, she only envied her for her piety, saying to herself that it was her righteous conduct that she owed the blessing of so many children. Then she besought Jacob, Pray to God for me, that he grant me children, or else my life is no life. Truly, there are four that may be regarded as though they were dead, the blind, the leper, the childless, and he who was once rich and lost his fortune. Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel, and he said, It would be better that you address your petition to God, and not me. Am I in his place? Or who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? God was displeased with the answer Jacob made to his sad wife, and he rebuked him with the words, Is this how you comfort a grief-stricken heart? As you live, the day will come when your children will stand before the son of Rachel, and he will use the same words, saying, Am I in place of the Lord? Rachel also made reply to Jacob, saying, Did not your father entreat for your mother with earnest words? beseeching him to remove her barrenness? Jacob, it is true, but Isaac had no children, and I have several. Rachel, remember your grandfather Abraham. You can't deny that he had children when he supplicated God in behalf of Sarah. Jacob, would you do for me what Sarah did for my grandfather? Rachel, what did she do? Jacob, she herself brought a rival. Hagar into the house. Rachel, if that is all that's necessary, I am ready to follow the example of Sarah, and I pray that as she was granted a child for having invited a rival, so may I be blessed too. Then Rachel gave Jacob Bila, her handmaid, to wife, and she bore him a son, whom Rachel called Dan, saying, As the Lord was gracious to me to give me a son according to my petition, so will he permit Samson, the descendant of Dan, to judge his people, that they not fall into the hands of the Philistines. Bila's second son, Rachel named Naphtali, saying, Mine is the bond that binds Jacob to this place, for it was for my sake that he came to Laban. At the same time she wanted to convey by this name that the Torah, which is as sweet as honey, would be taught in the territory of Naphtali. And the name still had a third meaning. As God has heard my fervent prayer for a son, so will he hear the fervent prayers of the Naphtalites when they are beset by their enemies. Leah, seeing that she was finished childbearing, while Bila, her sister's handmaid, bore Jacob two sons, concluded it was Jacob's destiny to have four wives, her sister and herself, 
and their half-sisters, Bila and Zilpah. Therefore she also gave her handmaid to wife. Zilpah was the youngest of the four women. It was the custom of that time to give the older daughter the older handmaid and the younger daughter the younger handmaid as their dowry when they got married. This Zilpah was so young that her body betrayed no outward signs of pregnancy, and nothing was known of her condition until her son was born. Leah called the boy Gad, which means fortune, or it may mean the cutter, for from Gad was descended the prophet Elijah, who brings good fortune to Israel, and he also cuts down the heathen world. Leah had other reasons, too, for choosing this name of double meaning. The tribe of Gad had the good fortune of entering into possession of its allotment in the Holy Land before any of the others, and also Gad, the son of Jacob, was born circumcised. To Zilpah's second son, Leah gave the name of Asher, praise, for she said, To me all manner of praise is due, for I brought my handmaid into the house of my husband as wife. Sarah did likewise, but only because she had no children, and so it was also with Rachel. But as for me, I had children, and nevertheless I subdued my passion, and without jealousy I gave my handmaid to my husband. Truly, all will praise me and extol me. Furthermore, she spoke, As the women will praise me, so the sons of Asher will in time come to praise God for their fruitful possession of the Holy Land. The next son born to Jacob was Ishakar, a reward. And once more it was Leah who was permitted to bring forth the child as a reward from God for her pious desire to have the twelve tribes come into the world. To secure this result, she left no means untried. It happened once that her oldest son, Reuben, was tending his father's donkey during the harvest, and he bound him to a root of dudaim, and went on his way. On returning, he found the root torn out of the ground, and the donkey lying dead next to it. The beast had uprooted it in trying to get loose, and the plant has a peculiar quality. Whoever tears it up must die. As it was the time of the harvest, when it is permitted for anyone to take a plant from the field, and as due to him is, besides, a plant which the owner of a field esteems highly, Reuben carried it home. Being a good son, he did not keep it for himself, but he gave it to his mother, Leah. Rachel desired the due to him and asked Leah for the plant, who gave it to her sister, but on the condition that Jacob, when he returned from work in the evening, should tarry with her for a while. It was altogether unbecoming conduct in Rachel to bargain so with her husband. She gained the due to him, but she lost two tribes. If she had acted otherwise, she would have borne four sons instead of two, and she permitted another punishment. Her body was not permitted to rest in the grave beside her husband's. Jacob came home from the field after dark, for he observed the law obliging a day laborer to work until darkness sets in. And Jacob's zeal for the affairs of Laban was as great in the last seven years after his marriage as it had been the first, when he was serving for the hand of Rachel. When Leah heard the brain of Jacob's donkey, she ran to meet her husband, and without giving him time to wash his feet, she insisted on his turning aside into her tent. At first Jacob refused to go, but God compelled him to enter, for to God it was known that Leah acted from a pure, disinterested motive. Her Dudaim secured two sons for her, Ishakar, the father of the tribe that devotes itself to the study of the Torah, thus his name meaning reward, and Zebulon, whose descendants carried on commerce, using the prophets to enable their brethren of Ishakar to keep at the studies. Leah called this last-born son of hers Zebulon, dwelling place, for she said, Now will my husband dwell with me seeing that I have borne him six sons, and also the sons of Zebulon will have a goodly dwelling place in the Holy Land. Leah bore once more, and this last time it was a daughter, a man-child turned into a woman by her prayer. For, when she conceived for the seventh time, she spoke as follows, God promises Jacob twelve sons, I bore him six, and each of the two handmaids is born him two, if, now, 
I would bring forth another son, my sister Rachel would not be equal even to the handmaids. Therefore she prayed to God to change the male embryo in her womb into a female, and God hearkened to her prayer. Now all the wives of Jacob, Leah, Rachel, Zilpah, and Bila, united their prayers with the prayers of Jacob, and together they besought God to remove the curse of barrenness from Rachel. On New Year's Day, the day when God sits in judgment on the inhabitants of the earth, he remembered Rachel and granted her a son. And Rachel spoke, God has taken away my reproach. For all the people had said she was not a pious woman, or else she would have borne children. And now that God had heard her prayer and opened her womb, such idle talk no longer had any reason. By bearing a son, she had escaped another disgrace. She had said to herself, If Jacob has in mind to return to the land of his birth, and my father will not be able to hinder his daughters who have borne children from following their husband with their children, but he will not let me, the childless wife, go too, and he will keep me here and marry me to one of the uncircumcised. She said furthermore, As my son has removed my reproach, so Joshua, his descendant, will roll away reproach from the Israelites when he circumcises them beyond the Jordan. Rachel called her son Joseph, Increase, saying, God will give me an additional son. Prophetess as she was, she foresaw that she would have a second son. But an increase added on by God is larger than the original capital itself. Benjamin, the second son, whom Rachel regarded merely as a supplement, had ten sons, while Joseph begot only two. These twelve together may be considered the twelve tribes born by Rachel. Had Rachel not used the form of expression, The Lord add to me another son, she herself would have begotten twelve tribes with Jacob. Jacob flees before Laban. Jacob had only been waiting for Joseph to be born to begin preparations for his journey home. The Holy Spirit had revealed to him that the house of Joseph would bring the destruction of the house of Esau, and therefore Jacob exclaimed at the birth of Joseph, Now I need not fear Esau or his legions. About this time, Rebekah sent her nurse Deborah, the daughter of Uz, accompanied by two of Isaac's servants, to Jacob to urge him to return to his father's house, now that his fourteen years of service had come to an end. Then Jacob approached Laban and spoke, Give me my wives and my children, that I may go to my own place and to my own country, for my mother has sent messengers bidding me to return to my father's house. Laban answered, saying, Oh, that I might find favor in your eyes. By a sign it was made known to me that God blessed me for your sake. What Laban had in mind was the treasure he found on the day Jacob came to him, and he considered that a token of his beneficial powers. Indeed, God had wrought many a thing in the house of Laban that testified to the blessings spread abroad by the pious. Shortly before Jacob came, a sickness had broken out among Laban's cattle, and with his arrival it ceased. And Laban had had no son, but during Jacob's time in Haran, sons were born to him. The only pay Jacob asked in return for his labor and for the blessings he had brought Laban was the speckled and spotted goats of his herd, and the black among the sheep. Laban assented to his conditions, saying, Behold, I would have it according to your word. The arch-villain Laban, whose tongue wagged in all directions, and who made all sorts of promises that were never kept, judged others by himself, and therefore suspected Jacob of wanting to deceive him. And yet, in the end, it was Laban himself who broke his word. No less than a hundred times he changed the agreement between them. Nevertheless, his unrighteous conduct was of no avail. Although a three days' journey had been set between Laban's flocks and Jacob's, the angels were happy to bring the sheep belonging to Laban down to Jacob's sheep, and Jacob's herds grew constantly larger and better. Laban had given only the feeble and the sick to Jacob, yet the young flock, raised under Jacob's care, were so excellent in quality that people bought them at a heavy price. 
Jacob had but to speak, and the flocks bore according to his desire. What Laban deserved was utter ruin for having permitted the pious Jacob to work for him without hire, and after his wages had been changed ten times, and ten times Laban had tried to overreach him. But his good luck with the flocks was only what Jacob deserved. Every faithful laborer is rewarded by God in this world, quite regardless of what awaits him in the world to come. With empty hands, Jacob had come to Laban, and he left him with herds numbering 600,000. Their increase had been marvelous, an increase that will be equaled only in the messianic time. The wealth and good fortune of Jacob called forth the envy of Laban and his sons, and they could not hide their vexation. And the Lord said to Jacob, Your father-in-law's countenance is not favorable towards you as before, yet you linger with him. Return to the land of your fathers, and there I will let my Shekinah rest on you, for I cannot permit the Shekinah to reside outside the Holy Land. Immediately, Jacob sent the fleet-footed Naphtali to Rachel and Leah to summon them to consultation, and he chose an open field as the place of meeting where no one could overhear what was said. His two wives approved the plan of his returning home and Jacob resolved at once to go away with all his substance, without as much as acquainting Laban with his intention. Laban was gone to shear his sheep, and so Joseph could execute his plan without delay. That her father might not learn about their flight from his magical teraphin, Rachel stole them, and concealed them on the camel on which she sat. This is the manner they used to make those evil images. They took a man who was the firstborn, killed him, took the hair off his head, then salted the head and anointed it with oil. Then they wrote the name on a small tablet of copper or gold and placed it under his tongue. The head with the tablet under the tongue was then put in the house where candles were lit before it, and when they bowed down to it, it spoke to them on all manners that they asked, and that was due to the power of the name that was written on it. Next, the covenant with Laban. End part 20 of 95, thelegendsofthejews.com.